Hello, so my name's Sam Rogers. I'm the editor of The Guardian's uh, data blog and data store. Uh, my background is not as a developer or a uh, techie or anything clever at all, really. I'm, I'm just a news editor. In fact, my first day on the news desk was September the 10th, 2001. And um, I think it's no coincidence that since then we've seen this amazing kind of uh, flood of world of data. Um, I just want to say thanks to uh, Tim and Ed and everybody at O'Reilly for having me again this year. It really felt like in February we were at the beginning of something. And now it feels to me like we're the, um, in the middle of something. So I originally titled this uh, 10 Ways Data is uh, Going to Change Journalism. And I realized actually a lot of this stuff we're actually already in the middle of. Um, the first thing to say is that um, we think of this subject, this whole area, as being very kind of trendy and new. In fact, none of it is entirely new. This is the, um, the Guardian's old paper, May 1821 is the very first issue. In those days, adverts were on the front page. There are some people who would like that still to be the case. Um, now, a news was on the back page. And the, uh, this is the original first news page from May 1821. You can see a third of that page is a table of data. That's data from schools in Manchester. And the reason it was sent, it was leaked to us at the time, which is something, as we know, leaked information is becoming a big thing for newspapers now. This was leaked to us by somebody, uh, because the official data was rubbish. It was compiled by the people who ran the schools. It was uh, partial. It was inaccurate. So to have accurate information that people could access was important, not least because without knowing what's going on in the world, how can we make it a better place? And that rationale still stands with us today. If you fast forward 150 years, this is how we present information now. This chart shows... Uh, public spending by government department in the UK. Each of those circles is a different government department. Now, that's not something we can just ring up the Treasury and get. We have to go through each government department's back accounts. They're all PDFs, which, as you know, PDFs are not exactly the most friendly format for data. Really important things, like how much the government spends on the war in Afghanistan, is not included in that data. We have to then go and make extra inquiries. It's like a whole process has to go on before we can generate that. It's journalism. But it's journalism that's presented in a new way. So thinking about how data journalism has changed and how data has changed, first thing I'd like to say is that what we do, a lot of what we do is about curation now. There's so many sources of data out there in the world. If you Google carbon emissions or crime rates or anything that you want to find out about, you're going to get a million responses back. There's all sorts of you know, really good sources, people like Data Market, InfoChimps. Uh, there's data.gov, data.gov.uk, all of these sources crowding around for people's attention. So what we're trying to do is say to people, well, here is a source. We're a resource. If you trust us, trust us to come up with the data. And um, what we try and do is make that data public. We've got the Guardian data store where we basically put all this stuff online and we put it out there in Google spreadsheets so they're easy for people to download and do stuff with. We'll do visualizations. We'll just talk about the data and we'll kind of share it around. This is a a typical kind of week's worth of uh, data stuff. The blue chart there was about uh, OECD education figures. So you're comparing education spending or class sizes between the UK and the US and Europe and so on. We've got uh, graphics and data on London Fashion Week, which is this week, um, uh, UK uh, closed imports. And that map down there at the bottom is very troublesome. Uh, this was basically data that was released last week by the Boundary Commission. In the UK, when there's, a, there's an election, you vote for your local member of parliament, which is constituency. And what happened is that the Boundary Commission were changing all the boundaries for elections in the UK. There are 500 new seats. So we said to them, can we have a map, please? You know, our readers would like to know what's going to happen in their seat. And they said, oh, well, we're going to put out 500 maps, all as PDFs. So we said, sure, you must have a shape file. Oh, no, no, that's, um, that's secret information. So basically, we used the data that they had. We worked with a GIS specialist who, who put the data and managed to visualize it. So for a day, we had the only map in the UK of the new electoral boundaries, the only place that people could find out what their constituency was going to be. So we're still, even with all the battles for open data, we're still fighting um, incredible inefficiency in the heart of government. Um, often now, we're data providers. We've started setting up these data searches. There's world government data, basically crowds together all of these open government data sites around the world and you can search for crime or poverty figures or whatever and you get results back from the UK, from the US, from California, from New York um, and we've done the same thing with aid data. Increasingly it's again trying to be a place, single place that people can go to because how do you know where to go to in this new world? And what we're noticing increasingly we're having to deal with enormous data sets now. These are huge things, the four million, maybe they're not big to some of you guys but they're big to us. 
if you're working something like WikiLeaks, 400,000 lines, so that's a big data set. But also increasingly, they're about really, 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 really tiny geographic places and really, really small things. So, for instance, um, this map here is a map of London, that's the Thames in the middle, by poverty. And what happens is the UK government every year puts out these indicators for every little place in England. And they're very small areas. They're about 10,000 people. So, you know, they're interesting. And they use those to decide how much money each place gets for education or health or so on. So they're kind of important. But, of course, they're released in the least accessible format possible. You know, nobody knows these little areas. They're not proper boundaries. We have to get hold of the map. So this is just something we did using Google Fusion Tables, a way for people to kind of find their way around the data. We also deal a lot with kind of huge public spending exercise. This um, was something we did on public spending over £25,000. The government released every single item over £25,000 for the first six months it had been in power, which is an enormous data set. It's 175 spreadsheets, which, you know, our readers have time to go through 175 spreadsheets. So what we did was we just started to put all that stuff together, and we visualized it, and we worked out who the big suppliers were, who the big companies are that get government contracts. But the key thing we did, which we didn't think was going to be that important, was we provided a search for people where you could go in and you could search for something and you could download the data for yourself. And so it says, and one of our readers, for instance, uh, looked at flag flying and found there was over a million pounds spent by the UK government on flag flying every year in you know, a time of budget cuts, which is interesting. And that was a story for us then in the paper. So it's, again, putting that data out there and hopefully getting something back. Again, with uh, WikiLeaks, we had enormous kind of leaked release of data um, is an incredible amount. If you think the Pentagon Papers, which is previously the biggest data release on Vietnam, that was, well, release leak, that was 7,000 documents. Uh, the one on Iraq was um, 391,000 instants. So what, for what can we do? How can we display this? So we had all the instances, we took all the instances where somebody had died, and using Google Fusion Tables again, because it's very easy to use, we just threw them at a map, and that's what that map is. Each of those red dots is an incident where at least one person died. And there's one thing that brings home what that war was about. It's that map. But again, that's working very, very big data sets and trying to make them accessible for people. Now, we have kind of dabbled with crowdsourcing on the site, and we've done it with kind of varying success. What we found is that, useful as it is, for us it hasn't produced kind of meaningful data yet. So, for instance, we did something with MPs' expenses. Members of Parliament have to make expenses claims in the UK because they don't get paid very much. They all top it up on, on claims for accommodation and so on. And the government released uh, 400,000 uh, documents, which are PDFs, which are receipt, individual receipts. And so what we asked people to do was help us go through that because we can't go through that data. And people did. They went through the data for us and they generated stories for us. So while it didn't produce kind of, you know, uh, useful facts in the sense of uh, data and numbers. What it did produce was amazing stories for the paper. And you have one person, for instance, went through 29,000 documents. That's one person. They probably know more about this subject than our entire politics team. And it's about using those people and bringing them in. We did the same thing with something a bit close to home for you guys uh, with the Sarah Palin emails, which, of course, was where you had something that was electronic to start off with, printed out on paper, and we had to take home boxes and boxes of paper. And we scanned them all in and asked readers to help us go through them. Obviously, in the, in the event, there wasn't actually that much in them, but we needed our readers to help us do that. So it's useful for kind of generating stories. But at the same time, this new trend means that our open data means that we're not always the experts on everything. Journalism traditionally is about me sitting in an ivory tower throwing things out to you, and that's the level of our interaction. It's very much a kind of one-way process. Those days are so gone now. Now it's much more about us trying to embrace the expertise and knowledge that's out there. Also, the fact is that visualization tools have got a lot better. A few years ago, this is the kind of visualization you saw online an awful lot. Um, and now people can do stuff like this. This is Tableau, which I think are, are here, but which is an amazingly sophisticated visualization tool that anybody can use. And so the fact that we are not always the best people to do stuff and we're not always the best people to um, know what the answer is to a particular question is really apparent to us now. This is our Flickr group where we encourage our readers to go on. There's over 1,000 members, and they just post visualizations on all the time. It's Guardian Data Storm. You can have a look. It's really interesting stuff. There. We discovered a guy called Dave McCandless. That way, his information is beautiful. Um, but at the same time, uh, working with a good designer really matters. There was a kind of trend, I think, a few years ago, this idea that everybody could do everything. And we don't think that's necessarily true. There are things that people are good at. I like to think that I could be a great designer and I could be a great data analyst. I'm neither of those things. I'm kind of okay at both. 
And there are lots, but there are people who are good at things. So I mean, showing, whether it's showing uh, the major players in the phone hacking scandal or this chart here shows um, the makeup of Britain's civil service, the kind of the administrators behind the scenes. And each size circle is basically a, diff a different government department's unit. And one of the biggest units is the unit that's in charge of um, cutting the budget, which is interesting. Um, but you only get that once you see it on screen. But at the same time, also, working with developers is something, you know, we use a lot of free tools. We deliberately use free tools that anybody can use. Many eyes, uh, Tableau again, Google Fusion Table, Google, Google Spreadsheets, because they're easy to use. And I kind of think that everything we do should be easily replicated by everybody. But at the same time, when you work with a developer, it can make a real difference. So, for instance, uh, this shows attacks on, by NATO on different parts of Libya. And we found out, basically, NATO every day puts out this briefing update, just a PDF every single day, probably got about 25-page impressions, but it showed a number of attacks they'd done the previous day and where they'd hit and what they'd hit in each place. So essentially, that's the set of data, albeit in a terrible format. So what we wanted was something we could enter that data every day and we'd be able to create something that would change and evolve and grow over time, which is a new thing because newspapers tend to do interactives that were kind of fro frozen in aspect, frozen in time. They would exist for the moment and then that would be it. So this basically is still being up is updated every day as long as NATO attacked locations in Libya, and you can play it through time. And something that improved, we start off with a month's worth of data, um, started from, and now it's got hundreds and hundreds of incidents on. And that works because you're working with developers. So as Alistair Dant, who worked on the speaking later this week, you really see him, he's a fantastic guy, and amazing work he's done. Now, traditionally, data journalism has been very much kind of long-form journalism. Does anybody know what I mean by long-form and short-form? It's kind of uh, basically long, big pieces that take ages to do in short-form and kind of news, instant journalism. And data journalism traditionally fits into the latter of those categories. It's been the work that people spend months noodling about on some kind of minor bit of data and produce something that doesn't really have that much impact. And what we found is that increasingly our work has been about producing stuff very, very quickly that has an instant impact because that's when people want to look at stuff. They don't want to look at it in three months' time. They want to look at it now. So you might have not followed this story here, but um, in August, basically, we have four days of riots, really bad riots, probably the worst in living memory across the whole of England. It starts off in London after a, a guy was shot by police and kind of spread throughout the whole country. And what we found was, after the first night, people were kind of interested because it was happening in a very small area, and they kind of spread. And people wanted to know what was going on, and there was no single place where there was a verified list of incidents. Just a, a very quick thing. So this is just what we ran during the, um, the four days of riots. It was the biggest single thing on the site on two days in a row. And basically, each of those things, Google Fusion Map, you could zoom in to each of those locations and see what was happening. We're adding stuff all the time. It was almost kind of a live map update. And again, we were publishing all the data as a, as a spreadsheet. Anybody could download and do stuff with for themselves. And then we started to think, well, as people started to become arrested and when people were being charged for offences after this finished, we thought well, it would be interesting to work out where people lived and where the riots were. So we started to do that. We basically got hold... I'm going to talk about this in the next session... Uh, we're doing this afternoon, but basically we got hold of these court records um, from the Ministry of Justice, which is a really big deal in the UK because they never release this stuff. We started mapping this stuff out. So you can see on the map there, the white dots are where the riots happened. This is Manchester. And the red dots, if you can see them, are where people lived. There was a kind of riot commute going on in Manchester. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion also about what kinds of areas were people coming from. Were these poor people? Were they millionaires' children? What kind of people were they? So we took that poverty map you saw before, and we put it on there as well. And you can see where the red dots are. They're not, the red is the poorest areas, the blue is the richest areas. So you start to get a picture. And this is stuff that's done very, very quickly, within three or four days of us just kind of constantly at it and on the story. And we also got, as part of this story, we've managed to get hold of millions of tweets, 2.57 million tweets related to riots, hashtags that were going on. And we mapped these out, and we showed how... Um, the different, different tweets, the different things. That, that one at the end, the black one, the biggest one, is riot cleanup, which is basically where people were tweeting, come to his place and help us clear up, which is interesting itself. So again, it's using the data to try and tell a story very, very quickly. So um, data journalism as it is, is mostly pretty tedious uh, day to day, partly because of the nature of the stuff we're dealing with. This is a kind of our process. You, you start off with an idea of how we're going to do, what we're going to do with this story, what would work with it, what would, data sets could we mash together. And then we'll start working on the data, and that's the, the, what takes the time. The amount of time we spend with badly formatted data, getting stuff out of PDFs, uh, 
terribly badly merged columns. People like the Office for National Statistics in the UK used to publish data as books, and they still think they're doing that. So their spreadsheets look beautiful, but they've got all these merged cells and hidden columns and all this stuff that makes it difficult. And only when we've done that and we've worked on the calculations are we in a position to output. And that output can be anything. I've shown lots of graphics today because traditionally people think of data journalism as graphics. I'm running out of time here, nearly the end. And... Um, but it's not. It's about stories, it's about Im it's the images, it's about just publishing the data. Sometimes you can publish a list of numbers, and it's interesting. And that is the way that um, it's changed. And I suppose that is how we get something like this, which is this it shows uh, arms exports to the Arab Spring countries. But we only got there by wading through acres and acres of, of nonsense and rubbish till we got to the right place. And at the end of the day... It's all about stories. It's still about stories. This is James Cameron, who, whilst he didn't direct Aliens or Avatar, was a fantastic Guardian journalist. He was in Vietnam and Korea and told stories. He was a storyteller. And he said in the 60s that, you know, in the future, only computers will know the questions to ask. In a sense, that's where we find ourselves now. We find ourselves in a place where we can ask incredible questions because of the power of the tools that we have, our desktops. And I can really see a time in a couple of years where people won't be talking about this as data journalism. It will just be journalism. Thank you.